Well, hi everyone. There's been a lot of new developments regarding the plans to reconstruct the key bridge in Baltimore. The Maryland Transportation Authority released their request for proposals on Friday, March 31st. This allows teams who are interested to submit their proposal by June 24th, 2024. So a little over three weeks as a recording of this video to get these proposals turned in. These proposals consist of a technical proposal, basically outlining their team, their approach, uh, list the experience of key people. And I'm going to get into what are the key roles they're looking for on this project. And there's some insights as to what they're going to do this time around that they failed to do on the first iteration of the France, Francis Scott Key Bridge relative to peer protection measures. Also, there's news out about Johns Hopkins University performing a study it's titled a risk assessment for bridge impacts from ships and large barges. And the premise is that it's far more probable than people realize in the past. And some things really jumped out at me relative to what they have said their stated goals are for this study. So today I'm going to go over the RFP. It provides a lot of insight as to how this project's going to be designed and built. And then I'm going to go over the key aspects of this Johns Hopkins study, and also suggest some things that I think they should be considering that I don't think they are at this point. So let's go through some of the key roles for the design build team. And by the way, the Maryland Transportation Authority has called this a progressive design build process. So what they're gonna do is they've invited these teams to submit their technical and price proposals by June 24th, and then DOT officials will take a month or two, they've said sometime by the end of the summer, they're just gonna pick one firm, one team, and go forward with negotiations on scope, price, design details, and everything related to getting this bridge replaced. Now in this request for proposal, they indicate that the design phase, which they anticipate awarding this fall, would take about a year. And their plan is to have the bridge completed by October of 2028. And, that, and by completed, I mean all four lanes open to traffic. So let's look at some of the key roles that they're looking for for these team members to submit in their proposals. You have a design build project manager, design manager, construction manager, project quality manager, long span complex bridge engineer. So right now there's people out there probably scrambling to see if they can get on some of these teams with major contractors or major contractors are looking for designers in this space. People in key roles are typically expected to join these teams in an exclusive arrangement. That way your team has a competitive advantage. Let's say there's a key role and you've got maybe the best person in the world on your team for that role. You don't want them basically teaming up with other people. So now there's other professionals that at a different level or they may be so specialized that it may not be really fair to expect them to be exclusive, in which case they'd be expected to sign non-disclosure agreements so they're not communicating information from one team to the next. But I suspect that most of these team members are going to be exclusive to a given team uh, given the short time frame for this pursuit. We also have Vessel Collision Protection Design Manager, Bridge Erection and Removal Manager, Geotechnical Design Manager, that's my area of expertise, Environmental Compliance Manager. There'll be some environmental issues, but the contractor will not be preparing the NEPA study for this. That'll be handled by government officials. And I suspect that those officials will streamline this process. They're gonna have to if they're gonna get this bridge rebuilt and open by October of 2028, basically four years of construction, well really three years of construction after the design's complete, but I suspect that there'll be some early construction activities based on some of the early design phases. So it may be that they can start installing their foundations well before they've got everything figured out with the superstructure. And I've done a previous video about what I think is gonna be the replacement bridge for this project, and it's undoubtedly gonna be a cable stayed bridge. Some other roles here, intelligent transportation systems. So 
Those include camera and other instrumentation systems for roadway and bridges to provide information and warnings to motorists. Cost estimator, quality manager, project controls engineer. And here's one of the key roles, I think it's interesting, vessel collision protection design manager. So clearly they're not gonna make the same mistake twice. The key bridge prior to its collapse had wholly inadequate peer protection measures. Those small 25 foot diameter dolphins that were hundreds of feet upstream and downstream of each pier on the main span of the bridge. And of course, MV Dolly struck the upstream side of Pier 17, bringing down most of the bridge, including all of the main span. So in this phase, it's much like a beauty contest. You're trying to put together a team that has world-class credentials and experience for projects of this nature. So major bridges going over large waterways I mean, the, the previous key bridge was 1.7 miles long. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, most of my work in the last 20 plus years has been almost exclusively uh, bridge related work. I've performed construction phase testing of bridge foundations, driven pile and drill shafts. So I've noticed that you get a different class of contractors for over water work you know, people are typically set up to do either land-based work or water-based work just because of the scale of the equipment that needs to be used for overwater work. There's just more specialization. There's a lot, lot more that goes into it. So the other key thing will be the disadvantaged business enterprise goals are nearly 26%. I think it's 25.6% on this project. So what does that mean? The definition of a disadvantaged business enterprise, this is from U.S. Department of Transportation, are for-profit business concerns where socially and economically disadvantaged individuals own at least 51% and also control management and daily business operations. African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asian Pacific, and subcontinent Asian Americans and women are presumed to be socially and economically disadvantaged. Other individuals can also qualify as socially and economically disadvantaged on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, that's, that's common to have these type of participation goals on federally funded and state funded projects. Although I can tell you uh, having a participation goal of nearly 26% is gonna be really, really tough. In fact, I've seen contractors and design build teams just have an inordinate amount of difficulty meeting those goals at, at even much lower levels. But again, this is gonna be important consideration for the selection of the successful team. Unless there are local suppliers of major components for a bridge like this, I would think that those DBE goals are gonna to have to be met through people performing services, uh, construction services, other specialty services, and the successful design build contractor is likely to have to be willing to provide an extensive amount of training in order to uh, increase the participation in, this, in these areas. Although the unemployment rate in Baltimore County is already quite low. I pulled up this information. It's currently 2.2% in Baltimore County. So extremely low unemployment rate. So it's not like there's a, a bunch of people just waiting for an employer to come and come to town, even on a relatively temporary basis to say support the construction of this project. So it'll be interesting to see how close they'll get to these required participation goals. Now I mentioned the Johns Hopkins study. Here's their website, Hopkins engineers studying ship collision risk for major US bridges. So if we go through here, indicate that chances are high for ships to hit US bridges like the catastrophe in Baltimore. So they're doing what they call as an urgent assessment to provide better guidance on how much risk a given bridge is. And they're gonna look at historical shipping information. There's loads and loads of data that shows uh, how frequent crossings are for a given size ship for a given bridge. So that gets to the probability side of things and that's consistent with the current AASHTO methodology that was originally established in 1991. It's 
since been updated. And the, the state officials who make up AASHTO gave themselves a pass, as I've pointed out in previous videos, on applying those design standards, which include risk assessment, or the probability, that is, of a bridge impact from a ship or barge, to limit it to new construction only and not be required to be applied to existing bridges, which is obviously a mistake. You know, the, the risk didn't go away for the key bridge just because it was built in 1977. Here's a quote here from John Hopkins' website. We need to know now, not five or 10 years from now, whether there's an outside risk to bridges across the country so that critical investments, which will take years, can begin immediately if they are needed. And again, as I pointed out previously, others are providing protection to older bridges, even though they weren't designed for such protections, just because it's common sense. And the uh, Delaware Port Authority, they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars providing collision protection systems for their bridge piers. And uh, I think for the key bridge, if they had done it a few years ago, you're probably looking at under $200 million to protect those piers on the main span of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And those would have likely consisted of a series of dolphins and most likely some form of island around the pier so that an errant ship would actually run aground before it would impact the bridge. So it looks like they've got a grant here from the National Science Foundation Rapid Response Research with the help of an army of students. The team will try to answer questions including what's the probability that the ship the size of the dolly would stray from its path and collide with the key bridge? I think that's a very good question to answer. What are the chances for similar bridge collisions across the country? Well, we already know that there are other bridges that are vulnerable, including the, uh, the Bay Bridge just downstream here. So. There's bridges in California that are being retrofitted to provide better collision protection. I mean, this is nothing new. There's been significant incidences in the last 40 years of bridge collapses due to barge and ship impact. The Florida Sunshine Skyway Bridge, I've, I've talked about numerous bridges where anywhere from uh, a half dozen to nearly 50 people have been killed in particular episodes of these collisions between ships, barges, and bridges. Here's another point of the study. Have we underestimated the probability of collision and ultimately the probability of failure of critical U.S. bridges? Well, that's most likely the case. The team will mine global shipping data, develop modern risk models, and then attempt to identify which critical U.S. bridges are vulnerable to a catastrophic ship collision. So they plan on building models to determine the probability of such impacts. Now the thing that's missing here, a true risk assessment addresses not only probability, but the severity resulting from such an event occurring. In this case, the replacement costs for the key bridge are estimated to exceed $2 billion. And that doesn't include all of the economic impacts. You know, a lot of this shipping that had to be diverted from Baltimore I, don't, I wouldn't say a lot of it, but some of it is likely to never come back to Baltimore. And of course, during the two months that the Dolly was plugging up the federal channel, the operations at the Port of Baltimore were severely curtailed. So it had a huge economic impact. So I don't think it's enough for Johns Hopkins to just look at the probability side of things. I mean, they, they clearly need to look at that, but they need to probably have a few economists looking at the impacts, not just from a replacement cost standpoint, but the broader economic impacts if a bridge were to be taken out. So only when you combine probability and severity can you truly arrive at a proper risk assessment. And I'm quite shocked that they say nothing about the economics here. So that's the quick update for today. I wanted to send out a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. Also, I want to thank those of you who provided super thanks. Check out the link in the description. I still have my free digital download of the biggest civil engineering disasters from the past 100 years. And uh, while you're down there, please hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons. Thanks very much, everyone.